subtitled, A Cry of Anguish and a Song of Praise. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I have cried desperately for help, but still it does not come. During the day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. I call at night, but get no rest. But you are enthroned as the Holy One, the one whom Israel praises. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted you, and you saved them. They called to you and escaped from danger. They trusted you and were not disappointed. But I am no longer a man. I am a worm, despised and scorned by everyone. All who see me jeer at me. They stick out their tongues and shake their heads. You relied on the Lord, they say. Why does he not save you? If the Lord likes you, why doesn't he help you? It was you who brought me safely through birth, and when I was a baby, you kept me safe. I have relied on you since the day I was born, and you have always been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of fashion encircle me, roaring lions tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfil my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Amen. Thank you for those readings. That was much appreciated. That, of course, is what we call a messianic psalm, and you'll all have recognised many of the incidences that happened uh, in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, particularly, of course, when he was on the cross, and uh, keeping in mind that this was actually written probably 900 years or so before uh, the Lord was even born. So it's a wonderful prophetic uh, psalm telling us uh, what he would go through.
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you have uh, in verses 1 and 2, For I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, nor of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. When St. Paul went to Athens, you will recall that the Athenians spent much of their time uh, discussing and hoping to learn new things. So when they found that he was uh, a man who came with some new ideas, they got him to go along and uh, they gathered around to hear what he had to say. When he spoke to them of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, some uh, said, well, we'll hear more about this later. But a very, very small number believed. And Paul, when he was speaking to them, recognising the fact that these were all intellectuals or people who thought they were intellectuals, he used wise uh, arguments, discussion. He quoted their poets and uh, spoke of their history. And he got very little in the way of results. So when he leaves Athens, the next place he went to is Corinth. And he says here, I didn't come to you guys with super intellectual arguments. I came determined to preach only one thing, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. In the church today, we can often hear sermons on eschatology and uh, and soteriology and quite a number of other ologies which most of us um, well we can't really relate to because the language used is not the kind of language which we would normally use in our day-to-day speech. We have tended to spend more time worrying about whether we were pre-tribulationists, mid-tribulationists, or post-tribulationists, or pre-millenniums, or post-millenniums, or any number of a host of other things. And we have tended to get away from the preaching of the cross. And then we bemoan the fact that so few people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ these days. Well, it's simply because we have stopped being, largely, evangelistic in our proclamation of the word. Now, many of these other things are well worth studying and uh, we should have Bible studies where one can look into all of these ologies. But when it comes to the proclamation of the word of God, we really cannot get past the proclamation that Jesus Christ has died on the cross as a substitute for you and for me. I mentioned before the song when I was on the cross when he was on the cross I was on his mind but if you consider Paul the Apostle's thought in Galatians chapter 2 he said I am crucified with Christ when you come to know the Lord Jesus as your saviour and you recognise that he has died in your place then you can identify with him to such an extent that you can in all honesty say, I am crucified with Christ because he took upon himself the responsibility for my sin 
And he paid the price demanded, which was the debt. Now, we do not die as a result of our sin, although if we're doing some kind of sinful act act, and died in the process, you could say that you died as a result of sin. But sin is not, uh, death is not the punishment for sin. Death is the result of Adam's sin, and it came down upon the whole human race. We inherited death. The punishment for sin is hell and damnation. In the Apostles' Creed, there is one line that in many versions today is left out. When it speaks of Jesus being crucified, died, rose again. In the original version, he was crucified, died, descended into hell and rose again. The thought of the Lord Jesus descending into hell is unacceptable to many people, apparently. But if he took upon himself the punishment for your sin and for me, then the descent into hell makes sense. It is to prevent you and I from going there He went there in our place. But thankfully, he did not stay there. He rose and now sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And in that total and complete sacrifice of himself, he won for us the right to eternal life and the right to be with him in heavenly places after we pass from this life. We do not know when we will go. We just simply know that sometime we will. Many of us, reading the signs of the times, feel that we will be alive when the Lord returns, for all the signs indicate that it is coming, he is coming soon. But of course, we do not know that. And the church, over many hundreds of years, has decided that the Lord was coming uh, back for his church. When Attila the Hun was doing his thing in the 6th century, the church of the day thought it was uh, heralding the end of the world. And as you come down the centuries, when terrible things have happened to nations, the people have thought it indicated the end. People who lived during the Depression and who were Christians have told me that the churches were full and um, ministers were having a marvellous time, zooming around, going to church after church, always having great congregations. And they all thought the end was coming. Apparently when your bank balance empties, there's nothing left except to go to heaven. So um, they all thought that that was, you know, indicated the end of the world and it didn't happen. In the Russian Revolution in 1917, the church of the day were quite comfortable with the fact that the Bolsheviks were going to take over because they felt that this was just the end of the world and that Lenin, the leader of the communists, was the Antichrist. And so they were thinking, well, we'll only have to put up with him for three years and then the Lord will come back and that'll be fine. And at 70 years later, the church was still under terrible persecution and dreadful things had happened and the commies were still there. So we don't know when the Lord will return, but we do know that the signs indicate that it will be soon. But how you define soon is up to you. The facts are, though, that when he comes, 
we are supposed to be out about our Father's business. And our Father's business is to proclaim the gospel, the good news of salvation to a world in darkness. We are to bring the light of the word of God into a dark world and show them Christ. It will not be easy. It never has been easy. It will get more and more difficult. We are told it will get harder. The Bible is to many people an offence. The gospel is an offence. Which in one sense is good because there is only one enemy which the scriptures cannot overcome. There is only one enemy that we can do nothing with. And that is the enemy of indifference. But rarely do you find indifference. When you preach the gospel, as John Wesley said, people should either get mad or they should get saved. And he would say to his preachers, well, if they didn't get mad at you, they must have got saved. And if the preachers said, well, no, they didn't do either, he would say, then I question your call to the ministry. Which is a bit harsh, but we are called to proclaim the word. General Booth of the Salvation Army, when they instituted their open airs, he made them have a prayer meeting beforehand. And he said, I want each of you to dangle over hell for half an hour so that you will go out and preach the word to people so that they will know what they are being saved from and you will know why you are preaching. We have got to get this everything back in the right perspective. We have got to be preaching and proclaiming the wonderful words of life. We have got to get back to what we have were once and which we have sadly drifted away from. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. The power for what? For salvation, for deliverance for mercy, for grace, for enabling us to live eternal lives with him in heaven. John Wesley said, Give me 100 men who know only one thing, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified, who hate only one thing, and that is sin, who love only one thing, and that is God, and I will change the world. Let us pray for 100 men, women, children, 100 people who indeed would give themselves so completely, so utterly to our Lord Jesus Christ that once again people would say, those men, those people who changed the world, who have turned it upside down, have come here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray for your blessings, your guidance, your grace. We pray for your strengthening. We pray for your enabling. For Father God, we truly need your help. We have a world to win. We have a town to win. We have a district to win. Father, we have a nation to win. And Lord, please be with us, we pray, as we (coughs) soldier on for you. May we do so with the power of the Holy Spirit the mighty hand of a mighty God with us. Father, we pray for your help and your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.